Hello there and welcome to the Whole Healed Holy Podcast, a place for conversations of the heart, for exploring healing, divinity, and all things sacred. I'm your host, Patricia Russo. I'm a mystic, muse, and spiritual teacher guiding women into their hearts with a journey of softening. I'm a published poet, a lover of hearts, and a forever student. Welcome, love, to a sacred pause and hopefully a few tingles, and to a reminder that we are all whole, healed, and holy. I'm so happy you're here. Let's slip into today's episode. I met my guest nearly 20 years ago when we were both in our first marriages. Three years ago, when I mentioned David Data's book, The Way of the Superior Man, in a Facebook post, I think this was it, David. David commented about the book, and it reconnected us. Literally, a lifetime and lifetime's worth of living has taken place between the time that we originally met and this reconnection. It was our shared love for this book that inspired a Zoom a few years ago for us to drop in with each other again. And this is when I realized how much we have in common, both abandoned and abused as a child and saved by a family member that believed in us, Mm. both on a long and powerful healing journey, both deeply in our faith, and both serving others as healed healers. Our conversation today is an open one about something that we are incredibly curious and passionate about, healing the disconnect the universal wound between the feminine and the masculine. A bio that you can easily find for yourself um, would say, Mm -hmm. in 2017, David was called to begin hosting and facilitating an annual spiritual growth and rejuvenation retreat for men. In the summer of 2019, he began formal coaching training under master coach Marianne Lead, receiving his professional coaching certificate from the International Coaching Federation. Additionally, he has trained extensively in neuro-linguistic programming and Enneagram as a method for creating profound change. David is known for his gentle, empathic wisdom. He cares deeply about others and loves helping people reframe situations to find peace in the midst of difficulty. For the past two decades, he has remained deeply committed to doing the deep and often challenging spiritual work required to heal and grow. His passion for self-development and spiritual sensitivity has equipped him to listen and coach with compassion, kindness, humor, and insight. Clients benefit from his insight, but also from his ability to help them reprogram their subconscious to be in alignment with their deepest desires. Sober since January of 1999, he is frequently asked to share 12-step principles to help people overcome fear, anger, and shame. As a tenured professor, he utilizes foundational teaching principles to lead, teach, and mentor others into knowing and living a life of purpose. As a classically trained artist, He sees the beauty in the world that others overlook. As a coach, he helps others to see the beauty in themselves that may otherwise be overlooked. Abandoned by his father and abused by his stepfather, at the age of 19, David turned to alcohol and anything he could find to numb the pain from his childhood. Suicidal, bankrupt, and desperate, David got the help he needed from friends, mentors, and strangers to start the healing and recovering process. Coaching and teaching is a natural outgrowth of the gratitude he feels for those that have listened, loved, and helped him have the amazing life that he has today. David currently lives in a beautiful historic home in downtown Indianapolis with his wife, Amber, five children, cat, dog, and birds. (laughs) In addition to coaching, David is a professor of art at Franklin College and an award-winning artist. Rather than sharing how I see you, David, which is how I like to start these podcasts, I'd like to share how I feel you. 
because this is what I love the most about being in your presence. I feel safe. I feel mm. seen. I feel like I'm in the presence of a superior man. I feel your heart. I feel your desire to attune to me, to connect with me, to share space with me. I feel creative and inspired by your art. I feel moved by the father and the husband that you are. And I feel incredibly grateful to you for the work that you're doing. I also feel valued and I feel into my worthiness when I'm with you, which is a tender spot that I'm currently and forever investigating. And I feel God through and with you. I feel the masculine, the healthy, safe, loving, masculine with you. Mm. And I love that you're here with me today. And I love that you're the first man on the podcast, the first of many I hope to come, um, sharing this conversation that we're opening up to share with others that you and I started a couple of years ago. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's going to be a great conversation when I get teary uh, in the first few minutes. So, yeah, that was beautiful. And I feel so honored every time we talk, but especially today. So it means a lot. Thank you. I know your faith has played a huge role for you in your healing journey. Have you always been faithful? And what is your faith and belief exactly? I want everyone like who doesn't know you, I want everyone to know exactly what faith means to you and where does faith live in your work? And would you say that faith is a requirement for being considered a superior man? Oh man, there's like 15 <laughs> questions in there. Patricia. Boy, I wish I could give you a very quick synopsis of my faith journey, but it's been messy. I grew up in a home where my mother had had a big church hurt. And so I was shielded from any spirituality or religion. I grew up in the Bible Belt. I knew nothing about Christianity or religion at all. As a child, I was asking questions about reincarnation and like spirituality. And as I began noticing people that were religious, I could see the hypocrisy in it, and I didn't want any part of it. Mm -hmm. By the time I was a teenager, I was deeply hurt and troubled, and I was already starting to self-medicate. And fortunately, I had not discovered my drugs of choice yet, or I would have been off to the races, mm -hmm. but I was not well. And like many of my generation, I went to the mall on Friday night and walked the mall as a teenager. That was, uh, and I was a big kid. So some college students circled up, at, well, asked me if they could ask me some questions. They thought I was a college student. I was only 13 at the time. And they really told me of a God, a father that wanted a relationship with me. And that loved me, even though I had made mistakes. And my own father had given up all rights to me when I was eight. And my stepfather was super critical and abusive. And so that like really touched something very deep in me. Mm -hmm. All I needed to do was say a prayer of surrender. Mm -hmm. And I could have that relationship. In a mall in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I said this prayer with a bunch of strangers. And that was my first, first of several spiritual experiences. Wow. I remember being so happy that I wanted to sing, but all the songs I knew were incongruent with this kind of love. I came home that night and my parents were like, what is going on with you? And I tried to tell them about this loving God that had this compassion for us and wanted this relationship and this feeling. I remember my stepfather saying, oh, my gosh, David's gone religious. And I was like, what? You knew about this and you had not told me? Like, I was really upset about it. There was a lot of pushback, actually, from my parents growing up. And that was my teenage rebellion was going to church. 
I read the Bible all the way through three times that first year. And I went to a church where that we studied Greek and Hebrew. And, and at some point, it went from this connection with this loving higher power to my ego re-manifested. There was not a safe place for me to question and talk about issues of shame and fear and resentment. Those things weren't healed. And so I so badly wanted to be accepted and loved that my spirituality became a veneer. And when I went to college, that veneer cracked. I couldn't do that perfectly, and I abandoned it all. Within 24 hours, I'll never forget the day. And I took my first drink. I lost my virginity, and I deliberately turned away. And that led me to my prodigal years of learning what that was until I was in that very, very dark place in my uh, mid-20s. And I had yet another spiritual experience where I prayed to a God I didn't believe in. I had been saying for months, something has to change. I can't do this anymore. I said this prayer, and after my last drunk, which was a bad one, I couldn't stand the pain of being in my own head anymore. And so I said this prayer to a God that at that point I didn't believe and I hadn't felt connected with because I had so much, I had done so many things that I felt so deeply ashamed about. So I was so blocked off from spirit that, yeah, I said that prayer and I felt peace for the first time in a long time. I had this crazy idea to not drink, which had not really been (laughs) part of my thinking. And so I wrote on my calendar that year. That was back when you used to buy calendars. On the top of my calendar, this year I'll suffer less. And, you know, I stopped drinking. I had my last drink uh, New Year's. I had a toast of champagne New Year's, January 1999. Yeah, so that led me eventually into Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I tried to do it on my own. I was in Mexico trying to drink again. The bartender wouldn't serve me because I wasn't a part of that hotel. I realized that God had interceded for me again. He did help. I couldn't do it on my own. That brought me into a 12-step program, and I started doing the work there, and I started being mentored, and I started healing all the resentment, fear, and shame that was driving all of this. And then there's been several spiritual experiences along the way. So I'm sorry, that was a very long answer. Perfect. It gives us a great foundation and a few things really gave me a big tingle in what you shared. The first thing is the mall experience, which you hadn't shared with me before. So I love that I knew about you in this conversation already. And just my witnessing of it and just how I felt when you shared that was the power of being so open. What can happen when we have the capacity to open to spirit? Um, It's like they met your heart in that moment and, um, and the spirit this message went straight into your heart. Yeah. And I don't know that everyone is that way at 12. So that's the first thing that kind of resonated with me because I've always felt spirit from a very young age. And I think that some of us are more open maybe to that than others. And so that was that, that was how that moment kind of felt for me. And then the other part of what felt really deeply for me is this idea that we do kind of, our lives are woven in and out of seasons where we feel more connected and a little bit farther away from God, let's say. And that felt like a resonance to me too. And it's the times I think this resonates too with maybe with the work that we do with others, that people find themselves on their knees with God or wanting the peace from God or wanting the answers from God in their lowest moments. And so that resonates with me too, that you came back to your faith in a moment when you really needed, when you really needed it. And then you felt it kind of flood in again. And you've been on this really deep spiritual path. Do you consider yourself a superior man? Yes. I mean, I think the definition of a superior man to me is someone that's deeply grounded in purpose and values that 
really can only come from that spiritual place. I mean, that's the second part of your question. It's the eternal part of us. So if you don't believe in the eternal part, your purpose is only in the temporary. It's in the finite. And that's that's ego manifestation. And while those could be virtuous in some ways, it's short-sighted. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. I live next to a couple of blocks from a huge cemetery, one of the largest in the country. And there's these amazing old mausoleums and obelisks, you know, the, <laughs> the big uh, monument to so the phallus. There's hundreds of them and huge granite obelisks. <laughs> Such a bizarre idea that they would spend fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars to build a giant granite penis to mark that they existed. Mm-hmm. Here in this short time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. That to me is like this is the crazy stuff that the ego does when it runs the show. What you just said gave me like a deeper understanding of what this feeling is that I feel with you. And I'm so grateful that you just helped me to anchor into what it is. It's this really for me, a superior man is also the man who answers to God. Yeah. And it's the hierarchy. It's God, the mortal man, my internal masculine me. And because of this, because I know in the way that you just shared that you answer to, bow to, are in service to this higher spirit, yeah. this, this forever life, this forever existence. That in itself helps me to feel safer with you because it's a, it's a really strong foundation to anchor into. It's, a real, it's something really solid to feel into. As for the feminine, it feels more secure to me. It feels and for the feminine who also believes in God, you know, yeah. then we're anchoring into the same thing. It's like That's right. Such a beautiful, safe foundation. Okay, I'd like to switch gears a little bit from that okay. to this idea or this work that you do around with men. You call it a celebration of awesomeness, which I love. But I'd love for you to share what the celebration of awesomeness is in a nutshell. And can you tell us exactly what the nature of work is that you do with men? And I'd also like to just learn a little bit more about these men and Mm -hmm. who are the men that you're serving and what are they healing? What are you doing together? I'd love to get just a snapshot of that and why you call it a celebration of awesomeness. Although I think we can, we can kind of come to our own conclusions and it sounds really beautiful, but I'd love to just switch gears and just talk a little bit about what you do with men and who they are and what they're healing so that we have a better understanding. Yeah. Mm. The awesomeness is the men that come. It's all the different manifestations of the divine masculine coming together. I believe that shame is the driver of all addiction, all the terrible things in the world. It's that internal sense of not good enough or unworthiness, unlovableness. And I find that most of us carry around, whether you've had like a past like mine or yours or something else, most of us carry around. This is one of been one of the greatest things of coaching is I meet so many different people all over the world. And I find that they all have it. Right? And so COA is an opportunity for these men to get together. And we do an exercise on the last we have a big celebration on the Saturday night uh, dinner. And then I have them after they've met these other men, have them give me adjectives to describe the other men in the space. They're beautiful adjectives. And then I read it back and I say, you know, this is you. And they're like, 
very uncomfortable with that <laughs> because they haven't they haven't recognized those qualities within themselves. They can see it in all the men around them, but they can't see it in themselves. So, yeah, I created the whole thing because I wanted it. I wanted this kind of experience and I couldn't find one and no one was inviting me to one. So I made, I made one for myself Perfect. and it brings me tremendous joy. None of it feels like work to me. Yeah. So I've been thinking a lot about, because I have boys that are teenagers, I have a 14-year-old and a 17-year-old boy. I have watched systematically these beautiful open hearts as little boys. And just by the time they make it through middle school and high school, there's no safe place to be open and vulnerable with other men. Nor are there other men to hold space for that. And the only place that they can find to be vulnerable at all is with women, mostly. That was my experience. And so a lot of these men, by the time they get through college, they have guy friends that they talk about superficial, shallow stuff with. The only time they really feel intimate is during sex. And so they crave that. I think that that's a misnomer in our culture that men just care about. It's the only outlet they have for vulnerable, intimate connection with another human being, where they can start to feel seen and known. And so I try to create opportunities, a venue for men to have that with other men. And it changes something really deep inside them. Yeah, there's something really powerful and something distinctly different about men being vulnerable with women yeah. and men being vulnerable with men. Yeah. That is something that I just really want to presence here in this moment because it's, I think this is sort of the kind of one of the places that you and I came to when we reconnected and started sharing our work. And I'm going to go into this next where we realized how much of this work needs to be done in women's circles and men's circles, and then how much we can learn from each other. Yeah. Especially those of us that are healing these parts of ourselves that what my father taught me about men is something that I need to heal with other women. Yeah. I can do so much healing with other men, but it's probably better work to do as a foundation, as a new foundation with other women. And so what you just said was so important because this is part of, I think, part of what we're exploring right now. It, it's that, and what you said is so interesting that you're witnessing your boys going from open-hearted, fully expressed, sa feeling safe in that expression mm -hmm. to feeling like they have less and less opportunity to be fully expressed, feeling safe in their emotion, expressing their emotion, being vulnerable. And is that, would you say that is, maybe this is a conversation for a whole nother podcast episode, which we could do, not spending too much time here, but I think this is kind of part of the issue is that men have less and less opportunity to express anger in a healthy way or be emotional and not yeah. be called a certain something or labeled a certain something by that. Is it schools? Is it society? Is it upbringing? As far as you've seen with, I mean, these are two sons that have been raised by you. So is a, is a lot of it the programming and what happens with these boys in school and their peers? And yeah, what is your assessment of that? Mm -hmm. I don't think that there's any kind of healthy initiation into manhood. The men are gone working and they're not there leading their sons. There's, so there's no mentorship in those formative ages. There's no men's circle for them to go to. And so that really is, he was 16 last year. He had been begging me to go to the retreat for years. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I don't think it's appropriate yet. But then this last year, it was like, I think it's right. You know, he's it's a pretty mature. If you looked at him, I mean, he's six foot and 200 pounds. He looks like a full grown man, right? And he really wanted to go. And I was like, let's do it. And 
So he was the youngest that's ever been. And it changed him. I mean, he still talks about it. Like it changed it changed him because some of these men he knew because they're part of my circle, right? It's, it was a like, it's almost like a rite of passage, like being invited into yes. healthy masses. That's right. That's right. And we're missing that. We're missing that. And so many cultures are missing that. So That's right. Yeah. I'm bookmarking this to just investigate what cultures are still doing this. Yeah. If any well, are. It's not, there was nothing like that for me. And I desperately needed it. Mm-hmm. I'm getting more and more people that are coming to me younger and younger mm-hmm. for this kind of work. Young men that want this so bad. Something's happening in the world. They're so sensitive and like there's no place for it. You know, I think the trauma creates a kind of sensitivity in us. And then as men, there's no place to be sensitive. And then it's like it's self-destructive they're aware enough to realize that the old matrix illusion that power and money is going to bring the fulfillment they desire they see through it this next generation sees through it already and so they're not buying into that old matrix projection it's like a they're hurting they're sensitive it feels like there's no outlet. The things that society has promised that will make them happy, they realize that's not the case. Very disillusioned and um, giving people a tribe, a place, that initiation. I mean, I'm a dad. I, I love my sons and I try to give them that space with me. But William on the way, <laughs> on the way back, he rode back with me and and I was like, oh, so what was your experience like? And he said, it was really hard for me, dad, um, seeing all these powerful men listen to you and follow you and just like hang on every word you say. My whole life, I've fought you. <laughs> he was like, what's wrong with me? And uh, see, this is that origin of shame, right? Right. And I was like, nothing's wrong with you. <laughs> you're my son and you're also a teenager. Right. This is your job. You're, you're not supposed to be your father's best friend until. Exactly. <laughs> your job is to try to differentiate yourself from me yeah. and to question and fight me because you want to establish yourself as a man. That's your job. But in this community of other men, you can hear the truth. When we had these partner stuff, I was like, you cannot partner with me. You can partner with, you know, there's 30 other men. Pick one, right? And uh, yeah, that it changed for me, part of my purpose, seeing things like the old matrix idea of like, I have rental property. Like, I would love to have a rental home for each one of my children when I die. You know, this is sort of old matrix thinking, right? This is an obelisk of some sort. I realized that what I really want to give is this multi-generational spiritual transformation community that's not locked into the dogma of organized religion. You don't have to be an addict and an alcoholic to be in a tribe. And that it would be a safe space for men to heal that would go beyond me for my boys, but also for the husbands and sons of my daughters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, beautiful. It's a beautiful legacy. It's a long lasting legacy. Yeah. And this is oftentimes, this is certainly, I feel that, and I have felt that really deeply recently as I've been working on like really sitting with spirit and in my deepest wound. And I felt very recently this knowing that what I'm healing in this lifetime is so, 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 so old and not just for me. Yeah. And that's a legacy. I feel like when you can get to that piece of it, that feels bigger than any rental house or any property or any, any inheritance that you might leave here and worldly inheritance. I'd love to jump into the topic that we've been exploring around polarity because the time flies so fast for this podcast. And I like to keep it to about an hour, although I've had some really beautiful feedback that the time goes fast when listeners are listening. So I love that. 
and you and I, we could talk for a long time because we have such so many things that we're curious about, but we've been exploring the polarity work that we both do Yeah. Um, as we witness each other's work. And I'm deeply in this work with women and you're exploring this work with men. And when I shared my honoring your inner King work with you in that first zoom a few mm-hmm. years ago, you were really fascinated by this work that I'm doing, especially the result which softens women and brings them mm-hmm. deeper into their feminine. Mm-hmm. And this is the great paradox of this healing work that we honor our inner masculine, which raises our feminine. My teachers actually say that you cannot access the fullness of your feminine until and unless you do this work. And it's, and I didn't really believe that until I started doing it. And it's for sure, it happens every single time. Our query since then has been around doing this similar work with the circle of men <laughs> mm-hmm. with a possible outcome that if they honor their inner feminine, this will raise their masculine. Yeah. And I have a sense of why this is a curiosity for you, but will you just like going back to that conversation with me and this honoring your inner king and the outcome will you share what makes you curious about this polarity work with men especially through your lens you've touched on it a little bit already i think because there's not really an outlet for men to express to be vulnerable to express their emotions potentially that's the answer to the question of why you're so curious about this work because if the outcome is similar for men and women when we do this work of honoring the opposite pole of, of our leading energy then the men that you work with will have a better sense of this part of them, which will bring them in deeper into their masculine. Is that yeah. what really is your curiosity? Yeah. Yeah. So I believe that my father figures provided examples of different versions of really toxic masculinity. Okay. Right? My mother wound was really encouraging me to disassociate those masculine qualities and to create the mama's boy, the nice guy, the the friend zone guy. Okay. <laughs> the, Completely that. soften the masculine. Soften, soften, soften. Oh, yes. Yes. To be really, really good and nice. Now, what that does is it creates a shadow right? The shadow self. And so I flipped several times. In high school, I was the guy that every parent loved. Every mother of every girl wanted their daughter to, oh my, I was the safest, nicest, most polite. Secretly, I had a pornography addiction that no one knew about, right? But on the surface, like, I would only kiss girls and da da da, but like secretly. And then I had all the shame about my own desires, right? Right. So I had disassociated from that. And then whenever I had that moment where I flipped in college, I embraced all the bad boy okay. ideas. I became the shadow took over okay. and I became just that. Okay. So you see this in men a lot that are like ping ponging between, you know, the doormat and like the raging, uh... (laughs) the jock asshole, right? Do you want to be the best friend of the girl or the guy that she wants to sleep with? Right. But also it's just an unkind, selfish human being. Either way, we attract women that are the imago of that energy. So, (laughs) right. Yeah. You either become the enabler of some sort of like toxic femininity that's very selfish and self centered, or you become the bad boy. When I was the bad boy, I'd watch these women come to crucify themselves on me. They would come one after the other, and I would tell them to leave me alone. And the more I told them to leave me alone, the more they came. Yeah. Wow. And let me guess how your father was. You know, I could tell them who their father was. It was me. And so we seek out this version. So in healing that feminine energy in me that, you know, I don't want to throw my mom under the bus, but this conversation did happen. You know, she told me that I was young. If she thought that I was going to turn out like my dad, she would kill me. 
And my dad was the ultimate charming ladies man, like the most confident swaggering guy. I mean, he was an alcoholic and whatever, but that's who he was. And my abusive stepdad was the ultimate jock, like power, sort of what I say and what I do. And so I disassociated from both of those parts of myself. And a lot of my healing has been like bringing them back in, owning who I am and, you know, the sexual parts of me, the powerful parts of me, the leader in me, the charmer in me, like all of those characteristics back into me that I thought it was the male wound, but it really was the female wound, the mother wound in me that had caused me to disassociate from those parts. She wanted to be friends with me, but she didn't want to sleep with me, which was good because she was my mom. But that's part of the dangers of mothers raising boys is they make them into like their gay boyfriend, right? They demasculinize them. They incentivize them to be feminine. Yeah. Yeah. And then when they find themselves in a relationship, maybe often I'm looking through my lens and the women that I sit with. And myself, often what happens then is that that man is attracted to a really strong woman who's leading with her masculine because that's yes. not safe for him. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would love to ask you who your inner feminine is, David. As an artist, mm-hmm. you have, or has the healing and kind of the integration of this part of you needed to happen too? Because I would imagine that this part of you, this inner feminine part of you was praised and appreciated and given Mm -hmm. lots of space. That's right. Okay. So who is this inner feminine of David? Yeah. And how does having a deeper knowing and connection to this part of you as a man support you in your life as a masculine man, as a superior man, and as a coach Mm -hmm. to these men? Because I think this is the piece that we really want to explore that might have something to do with this new work that we might do together. Yeah. Yeah. The way I see this is my newest understanding is this. It's all this heart chakra. It's the, uh, it's all that love space here. It is the heart is that intersection between sort of the spiritual higher chakras, which I associate more with the divine feminine and the lower sort of masculine power and survival and these kind of traits. And this heart is that bridge between the two. And it's the intersection of the cross and that, you know, my divine feminine allows me to enjoy things in the moment and allows me to see the beauty in small things and allows me to sit and relax and really deeply listen and feel it creates a safe space for me to be open and vulnerable and hear and be heard outside of the masculine it creates the frame right work and the structure for me to feel safe in that, in me. The cross is such a powerful emblem for me because that the vertical is the obelisk, that it's locked in the eternal, the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, like rooted in the past, but, you know, shooting off into the future. And then the feminine is in the moment. It is the horizontal crossbar. It is this present existence. And it's constantly changing and turning the maypole, right? The divine masculine and the maidens dancing around it. So I see that cross almost like a three dimension, the bar's three dimensional spinning and whirling. And then that intersection is our heart. Like that is the piece that holds the divine masculine and the feminine together. I mean, I'm on the verge of tears. And I wonder if the sisters that I sit with are, this is the first time that I've ever witnessed a man share what it feels like for him to be connected to this part of him. And it's such an incredible affirmation of who I am. And it just feels so good to have that reflected back to me by a man. And this is kind of the bigger question, I think. And this is really why you and I feel drawn to do this work together, because I think we need these mirrors of each other in order Mm -hmm. to understand 
where the healing needs to be done or what the bridge is exactly. Because as I see it reflected back by you, this thing that I know and this thing that I've been doing a lot of healing around to be bigger in, I know that because you have a deep understanding and appreciation for this in you, that everything you are and everything that you do, David, will attune itself to the woman in front of you, whether it's your daughter, a colleague, your wife, somebody that you're serving, because you can source it, because you can source it and you can see it through your own lens and feel it in your own way. That's really what I think. I mean, this is what happens in my work with women. We're on a deep, deep, deep exploration and curiosity about the masculine. And we go within ourselves first to see what imprints live there by our mother and our father, by past partners, Mm -hmm. and whether or not we like all of that. So it's kind of like what you said. And then we're kind of, I liken it to like throwing all the puzzle pieces on a table Mm -hmm. and kind of hovering above the pieces and looking and some of them get thrown in the trash. They no longer serve us. Some of them get kind of renegotiated. Maybe we want the puzzle to tell a different story. There's a lot of healing along the way. There's a lot of forgiveness along the way. And we look at all the things. And then once that work is finished, it lays a foundation for us to feel first a deeper inner holding of this masculine that we really want to have to be in partnership with. And that really is the energy that we're tuning to outside of us that we're letting ourselves be found by. And many women that come and sit with me, their very first realization is, I don't know who this is. And as we start to explore him and as we start to come into what looks healthy or what feels healthy or what the heart's desiring in this masculine energy, many of us come to the sobering realization that we actually, when we look around, we don't have an example of that. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in a circle right now where there are two women who say to me, Pat, everywhere I look is an example of a masculine that is not safe, that is not trustworthy, that is abusive, or that is disrespectful. And so it's really important for us, I think, to do this work on both sides so that we come into a healthy feeling for both Mm -hmm. of these energies, whether you're a man exploring his feminine or you're a woman exploring your masculine. And this is really where we are, you and I, in this conversation. I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but this is really (laughs) where it brought us to this conversation. You are just touching on this next question, and I think we're going to go a little bit over today. I hope that's okay for you, David. What is Merkaba? Am I saying that correctly? I don't know. I always say it Merkaba in in my own. Okay. What is it? And how do you weave sacred geometry heart chakra, sound, sound frequencies, and God into polarity as it applies to the masculine and feminine. You really just answered that question because you said in a meditation recently that you were given this vision of the cross, of the heart being the bridge, of the higher chakras being the feminine and the lower chakras being the masculine. Is is there anything more here that you want to say about that? Just Yeah, yeah. So the bridge is this vertically. Here I'm showing you stuff. <laughs> People can see is the vertical bridge between the higher and the lower, but it's all in the horizontal intersection, like literally X marks the spot between our arms of the cross of the feminine and the vertical of the masculine. But it's also the bridge between you and I, because this is the place where you and your feminine and me and my masculine, we intersect and it's the same. And the Makawa in the sacred geometry it has these two pyramids, the upside down and the inverted, and it's the intersection of those things. And it's been coming to me in this crazy meditation stuff, all of these things kind of coinciding in this beautiful connection. That is the beautiful connection of the masculine, that's the place where you and I are one. So you can be in your feminine, I can be in my masculine, but in that heart love space, we are the same. Mm -hmm. We can transcend. It's not that I don't want to have polarity. Yes, I want to have polarity, but there's also times where I want to have oneness. Mm -hmm. And then that oneness, 
like you and I are one, right? The masculine and the feminine can be one out of that place of my heart. And, you know, one of the things that's really beautiful about our relationship, and this I had almost every time we talk, I'm just like weepy the whole time and shaky. <laughs> it's your inner feminine combined with my masculine. It really, really amplifies that heart space. And so it's a safe place for all of that energy to like just pour from my chest. And that is a big part of that healing of the shame, fear, and resentment is opening up that heart space for men getting out of their bellies and into their heart again. And maybe trusting that that they can hold whatever comes out of the open. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's beautiful. You and I are exploring a beta circle with men. <laughs> you leading from the divine masculine and me representing the divine feminine and our circle and work has kind of a working title of hidden in the heart inspired by the Hindu legend. What is your sense about men and their connection to their hearts? Like you have a deep connection to your heart. I'm imagining the men that you work with in the celebration of awesomeness are having deeper connections to their hearts. Like this is kind of the work that you're doing. Yeah. How can exploring their inner feminine help them to feel it, to heal it, or to lead from and with it if this is the ultimate goal? And is this something that men want to do? Like, I mean, I'm imagining that some men listening to this will say, like, why the hell would I want to connect more to my heart? And what's that going to, how's that going to serve me? Is it something important for men to do as you're in this work and as you are this man? And how might this make them more of a masculine man or a superior mm -hmm. man? The thing that I get the most when I'm trying to call sisters into my work is they say, I already have a strong inner masculine. Like my, I don't need my masculine to be stronger. Yeah. So I'm imagining that when men hear that kind of what we're up to, we want you to explore your feminine, <laughs> that they might say, ooh, how is that going to help me be more masculine yeah. or be a superior man or be in deeper partnership and love with my woman? Um, this is really what David and I are exploring in real time right now. And we'll possibly do a beta called Hidden in the Heart <laughs> if we feel brave enough. What is your sense about this, David? Do you feel like men would be interested in this, would serve them? Um, the outcome will be an outcome in service to masculine men and superior men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, my, <laughs> my experience with attracting men to this kind of work it only comes from a place of trusting me. They feel my heart. They know that they've seen change in me and they're like, I want some of that. Mm -hmm. And so out of that place, they will be really, really skeptical about it, but they would trust me. And this is how COA started in the very beginning. Just people are like, this sounds scary as hell, but I trust you because men have not ventured into this place. Most of the men I know have not. Now, there are some men that have done their own work, but these are not, you know, I'm trying to heal people that are sick, right? I'm not trying to just sort of finish off or find other people that are in that healed space. And so, yeah, you have those men that are really walled off and are really focused on sort of still matrix ideas of power, money, those kind of success measurements. And then you have sort of a nice guy, like I would associate with the opposite of your women that are very in their feminine and in the friend zone and don't know why and are stuck there. I have several men that I know that are like that. And they would be like, well, I don't, they want this sort of more masculine, but they don't know how to get there. I think it's going to be a hard sell for both of those men. Really, I think so. I think of what happens is for me is thinking about a core group of men that are willing that trust me enough mm -hmm. in my leadership to like go into it. Mm -hmm. And even though they're very uncertain and unsure, and if they change like I would imagine they would change, then that spreads to other men. That's how almost all of my coaching, all of my work has just been sort of word of mouth. People change and they tell other people about it. 
are most of the men in your circle and in your work um, partnered or are they single or is it a combination of both? Yeah, it's about half and half. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In my work with women, we explore the things that we learn about men from both our mothers and our fathers. We've touched on this just a little bit. I'm curious if this is also true for men. What do men learn about women from their mothers and their fathers? And is this more potent to cultivating a deep partnership and love with women? Or is it what they learn about being a man? You shared kind of what you learned about being a man from your fathers Mm -hmm. and from your mother. Mm -hmm. In the work that I do, we learn a lot more about men from our mothers Mm -hmm. than our fathers. And many of us have a direct learning, as is the case with me. I'm imagining that men learn about women from their mothers and their fathers, what a woman is, how to be with a woman. And then I'm also imagining that men also learn, and you've shared this already, what being a man is. You learn about what being a man is from your father, Mm -hmm. and you learn about what being a man is from your mother. And because you sort of had this mother who wanted you to be the man that she wanted you to be, I feel like that served you well in the long run, which is kind of a whole nother conversation. Like we've endured a lot of things in this lifetime to get us to right to this moment where we yeah. can be in deep service in our deep service. Is this question coming across clear? Like, let's just start with one thing. What do men learn about women from their mothers and fathers? Yeah. Is, is this part of your work? Like, do you unravel this a little bit? Because this has been true for you with the men. Yeah. So one of the ways that we got in touch is that I was like, I really wanted to be in one of your women's circles because I wanted to see the work and to figure out how to translate this into the work I do. And through our conversations, I have done a lot of contemplation and also self-evaluation, but there has not been, I've not had any instruction in this. And I've seen that a lot of the things I've done has addressed it indirectly, but I like the idea of addressing it directly. Okay. I mean, there's things I do that sort of touch on it, but it isn't a direct link. However, everything that you've said, like, and that's been my experience as well in me, is that, I mean, it's complicated because I had my father and my stepfather were sort of demonized and then my mother was my savior Mm -hmm. and how I maintained my mother's love was being very obedient and compliant and the good boy. Right. She taught you about being a man. Yes. Yes. And she also became the model for the kind of women that whenever Unless I was in my bad boy phase, and then I attracted women that enabled me. But then, you know, I would go into the good boy phase. And I associated being a good boy with being the spiritual man. And that's not true either. I've had to like shatter that. And I've done some reintegrating, you know, after my divorce, I've re brought in my divorce was so painful. Because I became the good boy. My wife was not attracted to that man. Right? Well, you're not. You know, a mother is not supposed to be attracted to their son. And we had that dynamic, right? It was the good boy trying to please her, trying to make her safe, trying to make her comfortable. And you don't want to sleep with that guy. Right? right? Okay. I mean, over time, that just really disintegrated our relationship. And it was so painful for me that I had to start doing this work. And this is where I found David Data through David D'Angelo, who is like a dating kind of expert guy. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, (laughs) it just, my mind was blown. I was like, every teenage boy should get a copy of this book to read. My son got one at the retreat because all the men, we bring books that have impacted us and we pick books that call to us. And so I was like, you need to get that book. I'm not (laughs) telling you to get that book because I don't want you to rebel against me, but that book, he's like, I know you've talked about that book. And so he got it and he's been reading it. So bringing back in, calling back in my stepfather, who was an athlete and a powerful leader of men. I call that back in and calling back in my dad, who is the most charismatic, you know, sort of sexual energy human being there was. And like, I could bring that back into me. 
And so acknowledge my mom's wounds. She was not the savior. She was the inversion of my stepfather and stepdad. She was both sexually really attracted to those, both, both those men, even though she hated them. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think it's interesting what we learned. I spent so much time on father wound because that was such a direct wound for me. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize until coming to this work, really, that we learned so much more about our fathers or about the masculine through our mothers. And yeah. interestingly, as you said, the shame piece for you is universal. And as you sit in circles you with men from all over the world, and the shame piece is really universal. Interestingly for me, as I sit with women from all over the world, it's this piece that mothers are passing down generation to generation to generation, Mm -hmm. this wound of the masculine Mm -hmm. that is universal. All cultures, all ages, all just, it's such a universal wound that we learn some of these things about the masculine that are not true or that are not healthy. And many of us are doing this work to, to kind of make it stop here. The last question we kind of already touched on, but it's about healing the mother and father wounds for men and how important this is. And I'm imagining that that is a kind of a big part of your work because we come to the source of, you know, we all come into this incarnation, I think, remembering that we're spirit and feeling close to spirit. And as you shared, Mm -hmm. as you witnessed your sons, like wide open hearts, expressive, vulnerable in the world. And then the conditioning and the programming and the abuse and the, all the trauma and all the stuff that we've kind of signed up for in this life gets piled on and then we have to unravel it. Just as a last question before I go into my three questions that I'd like to end with, what do the men that you lead want women to know about them? And I'm mm. asking you to just speculate because I'm imagining you haven't asked them this question or they're, you know, this isn't like a focus, but What do you think the men that you lead or that sit in your celebration of awesomeness would want women to know about them? Yeah. I think the the men desperately want to be respected. And I think women often believe that because men don't manifest pain or suffering or hurt the same way that women do, that they don't feel, that they don't care. There's a big, soft underbelly in all of us. It That hurt manifests in anger, control, workaholism, like those kinds of things. And I think that women are always trying to control and manage those things or have problems with those things. But it really is the underneath of that is, you know, they're hurting and they don't know how to get out. And there's an interesting dynamic. This is my speculation. This is my some of my experience, too. Men are really good in their divine masking of holding space for the feminine. Women can have a very hard time holding space for the masculine. It can be very difficult in a partner relationship because it can flop polarity in a weird way. And so men have to have that space outside of the relationship because every time they do, it flops polarity and it causes all kinds of problems. Yeah. Unless you're in a relationship or a partnership where there's an equal understanding, in my experience, there's an equal understanding of the energies and appreciation of the energies that live Mm. in both people. Yeah. And a permission to explore, to be, to dance, to move within those energies and an awareness to move into those energies or in and out of those energies as we need to. I'm in that relationship right now just naturally because my man, he's an artist too. And so he has a really beautiful inner inner feminine that I love. Mm -hmm. In past relationships, when I might have been by the nature of the law of polarity, kind of put into a situation where I'd have to hold him in any way or be Mm -hmm. the masculine in any way, I would be filled with resentment. Just like I'm going into this energy without wanting to. I'm being forced into this energy. You haven't asked me my permission. It's like, it was just all this, like, I don't want to be in this energy. Um, And then all the judgment that comes with that of Mm -hmm. the man in front of you that you're now Mm -hmm. having to be the man. 
that yeah. was my lens before kind of most recently this work that I've been doing for three years. And now I was in that last, that relationship in the last relationship where there just wasn't an awareness of the energies or a balance within each of us. And we weren't able to dance and kind of be in this. And that's really the nature of the energies. It has to be able to be, to move. Um, it's not static. Yeah. And in this relationship or in this partnership, and I think there's a distinction between relationship and partnership, especially with this topic, there's an understanding he has shared actually with me the strengths of my inner masculine, which he honors mm -hmm. and doesn't have any interest in overriding. Mm -hmm. And so when we come to those places where I know that he values my seeing, travel is a perfect example. Right. I will be the one on the team leading with the masculine for both. Yeah. Of them. Yeah. And I also find that he's an only child sensitive artist and with this really beautiful inner feminine that is beautiful about attuning to me from his masculine, which mm -hmm. is what I sensed and what I saw in you when you were sharing about your inner feminine. So I love that he has that kind of ability to attune to me from his own knowing of this part of him. He's French. And I think in the French culture, there's maybe it's a different culture with regard to how we raise boys, how they yeah. raise boys. And really um, there's in the U S I think it's a little bit harder maybe. And so the times when I feel his sensitivity or his feminine come forward, I feel like it's just natural for me to kind of be there. And it doesn't feel like the same resentment or the same forcing it's almost like this agreement that we have to kind of mm -hmm. be and that's where i love where you say it's like in this place of one it's not yeah. that i have to be in this and you have to be in that but when we're coming together for the purpose of being and we call it a team because he's french and this is the best word for us that's really sacred union for us and there's no resentment then for me to come mm -hmm. into that place because i'm coming into a place of one mm -hmm. and it's in service to me and it's in service mm -hmm. to him Mm -hmm. um, so yeah i love that and i love that men want women to know that they're doing work that they're wanting to be respected for well i think that men want that heart communion but that requires and they'll try it if it goes bad they stop yeah that's part of the work that the divine you know the feminine manifestation in the partnership has to work on if they want to have that kind of heart union with their partner. And so for me, for men is I try to create that space for them with other men first, so they understand that, so they know how to do that. So they have an outlet for it. And the ones that are already partnered, then that's a, like a whole dance of what's going to happen with their partner uh, moving forward. But the last thing we do before the retreat is over, we do this, interlocking knee exercise where our, we sit face to face like 18 inches from our face and we just hold presence for the other person for five minutes each and men fall apart it's the most things. intimate. i mean eye gazing is one of the most intimate things we can do with each other yeah yeah and they're really uncomfortable being that physically close. I have them hold hands, left hand up, right hand down, and then looking into each other's eye and just trying to be present. I've had people fall over, bloody noses, like all kinds of crazy things have happened in that experience. Yeah, that's how alone most men are. That's deep medicine, David. Yeah. That's deep medicine healing first for the men that you're serving and then healing for the for the women that they'll hold space for and that they'll be present for it's really beautiful they have to feel it first for themselves yeah, yeah. at the end of every episode i like to ask the same three questions and um we're here at this place we've gone a little bit over so i hope the listeners are still with us the first question is which do you relate to the most whole healed or holy and why yeah, it has to be holy. I'm not healed. <laughs> I'm, I'm healing. And 
whole as I identified with my spiritual self, yes, that is whole. That can neither be created nor destroyed. It's existed through many lifetimes, yes. But in this physical manifestation, the trauma has caused so much separation that I'm in the process of creating oneness again, of returning back to that good, beautiful version of myself as a child. And holy, as I understand, it just means of God. And that means me identifying with myself as a spiritual being, having a physical experience. And so I absolutely believe that I am holy of God. That is my true nature. And everything else is shenanigans I've picked up along the way that says <laughs> anything to the contrary. Okay. Yeah. A book that you love or have gifted the most? I mean, it has to be the way of the superior man. I like... I've looked into buying cases of that book because I've given away so many celebrating its 20th anniversary. Oh my gosh. I've given away so many of them. Anytime I go on eBay and I'm just looking for cheaper ones because it's like, how many of these things do I need to buy and give away? Yeah. That book, whenever I get lost, I reread that book because that's taught me so much about the divine feminine and what it is and how it works. And and as a result, me as a man too. Yeah. I require that book in my Honoring Your Inner King circle. When I first read it, that book found me on retreat maybe three years ago when I came to this work. I was sitting around the dinner table at a retreat with really incredible people. And they were all talking about this book. And I was the only one at the table that hadn't read it. <laughs> How can this be? Really, the book is binary. Not every woman and not every yeah. man who reads yeah. it loves it. So I understand that. And I know now why, because I love, I mean, I've, I've read it many times or a couple of times. What I loved about it is the same thing that you love about it, which is interesting. When I read it, I obviously assign it so that the women that are doing the king work can hear from a man the direction of what a superior man is. And I think that I can't show them that in a way that David Data can as a baseline teacher. And then you go from there. It's another perspective. That's why I sign it. But when I read it for the very first time, what I found that was so potent for me was I found that the way in which he described the feminine was huge affirmation for me. Mm. It was just like, oh my goodness, that's me. I thought I was the only one, or I thought I was old fashioned, or I thought this and that. And um, it was really beautiful affirmation for me. And yeah. I love the book. I love that we both love the book. David Data has continued to be for me. I've gone from there to other teachers, but he's continued to be for me a teacher that I have never learned directly from him, but I learn from his teachings. But it's a perspective that I greatly respect. Really. Yeah. How about a quote or mantra that you love or that guides you? And I know the past mm. guest has took your first choice. <laughs> if you want to say that one again, yeah. um, but, or if you have, yeah, you want to even just use that one again, it's okay. Yeah. I mean, that quote about until we make the unconscious conscious, it will control our life and we'll call it fate. That Carl Jung quote, I just, I use that with clients nonstop. And that really has been my own journey. I'll tell you a mantra though, that, that I say a lot is this prayer of St. Francis. And it's a big part of my meditation this is really you talking about what it means to be a superior man to me is that in order for the feminine to trust the masculine the masculine has to be directly linked with god it has the masculine has to submit to god in the same way that the masculine desires the feminine to submit to the masculine has to open himself up and allow god to fill him up that's that submission of the ego and so you know it's that god make me a channel of your love and wherever there's hatred in the world, may I bring, may I bring love, right? And wherever there's wrong, may I bring the spirit of forgiveness. And wherever there's despair, may I bring hope. And wherever there's darkness, may I bring light. And wherever there's sadness, may I bring joy to seek not to be understood, but to understand that is by self-forgetting that one finds and is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. That sense of the submission to God is the first and foremost thing that has to happen. And then in that place where I connect the supernatural source, that allows me to show up 
as the man that I was designed to be. Even if I have unhealed trauma, even if my mind's fractured. Um, it's a perfect love. Yes. Yeah. And that is that place that I can connect with all people, masculine and feminine, as out of that heart chakra as in that intersection. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Will you share the ways in which people can connect with you? And I'll put it in the show notes too. You have you serve both men and women in your private mm-hmm. coaching. Practice. Yeah. And then are you going to have a, the celebration of awesomeness is coming? It's a summer, it's yeah. a summer program. Okay. Yeah. So tell a little bit more about what you're what you have coming so that so the celebration of awesomeness.com, uh, the best website URL ever. And yeah, so all the stuff I do, the coaching I do uh, also like, and if anybody ever wants, I love just meeting people and talking to people. So you could just schedule a time. I set aside time to just have conversations with people. There's no sales pitch or anything else, just getting to know human beings. I love that. Also, like I have retreats, I have sometimes just little short, I have fasting retreats, silent fasting retreats that I do periodically throughout the year. And then we have the big COA once a year that's coming up at the end of August here in Southern Indiana. I do a thing called Warrior's Way, which is three month on sections around a topic. We're getting ready to start another one that's based on purpose, which is obviously the core of uh, Divine Masculine. and. That's group work that men do. We do it all virtual. Yeah, I'm, I have a little bit of TikTok stuff that I do. It's celebration of awesomeness too. I'm not super good about posting on Instagram or any of those things, but I love meeting people. Uh, I love hearing their story. I love getting to know people from all over the world. So, And also your art. So. Is there, oh, yeah. is there any art on your website or do you keep that? Yeah. One day I'm going to fuse. The, it, it's fusing the other in my head. It's all the same to me. People may uh, were really shocked because I was an artist and that's how I was known. And my Facebook crowd is like, what is all this coaching, spiritual okay. self-development stuff? Where did this It'll come from? Come together. But yeah, that's davidhcunningham.com. And the paintings are just my meditations of my heart, my connection with my holy a higher power. You know, it's God's voice speaking through me in the same way that uh, happens in coaching and everything else. It's all the same. Your work is beautiful. Thank you, David. I respect you so much. And I appreciate your time today and always. It feels so good to be with you right here now and on this path together and being a healed healer and serving based on our lived experience and what we've healed in ourselves. It feels really good to be here with you on this path. And I appreciate so much your time and always your open heart to wanting to connect with me and have conversations with me. And so if you're listening and you're interested in this possible beta that we're doing, that will be a hard sell. This is a standby. It's to be continued. Yeah. Thank you so much, David. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. It means a lot to me that we've shared this moment of deep conversation. If you feel inspired or touched by something in this episode, please leave a comment and or a review. For more in all the ways, please find me at Whole Healed Holy on Instagram and at www.patricia-russo.com on the web. Stay close, please, and know that you are whole, you are healed, and you are holy. Until next time.